once again extremely selective in trying to bring people here. I've known Steve Bedanes way back since he came here in 1980, but I feel like I've known him longer than that, and it's a real delight to have him here this afternoon. Steve Bedanes. Can I hang the phone? Because I gotta handle two, two deals. Okay, I'm all set up. This is loud enough. It's good. I think that was probably in, wow, it is loud. Enough of an introduction so that we could probably start with the first two slides and we'll see if we got them right. No, those aren't the first two. Those aren't even close. Well, that was one of them. Was Am I going backwards? I'm going forwards, but it's not doing it. I want to go back. I'm still, oh, there you go, it's backwards. While he's getting organized, I want to point out that we're not paying him anything for the election. Hey, this is, this is terrible. Let's start that roll on the right from the beginning. <laughs> These technical difficulties are going to be really rough. Hey, we're halfway through the show here. It's going back now. Let a lot of things out of the back here. Oh, it's going, it's going, good. Fabulous, huh? All right. <laughs> okay. Woo! Okay, as Marvin mentioned, I'm speaking today as a partner in uh, Jersey Devil Design and Construction uh, we take our namesake from that guy on the right who's a, uh, a famous New Jersey folklore character, and we did indeed start in New Jersey approximately 10 years ago. Now, we still maintain a small office in New Jersey, uh, that's it on the left, and, uh, but we're pretty itinerant now, as you mentioned, we work out of wherever our commissions take us. We physically construct all of our own projects, and we usually live on the site in sort of temporary uh, conditions. Now these are some of the first buildings that we built. Uh, Ten years ago, this is what we thought the future of architecture was going to be. Uh, lightweight, air inflated, uh, portable buildings. Um, solar heated, of course. And uh, actually they were, they got hot as hell uh, during the daytime and really cold at night. I'd say we probably oversized the glazing and undersized the thermal mass on them. Uh, they were a fantasy of another generation. They were a fantasy of a time when energy was cheap. This actually took energy to hold the building up. They had to keep those fans running. But people loved them. It was either like uh, being outside or being totally hermetically sealed in something completely new. They were all structure and all skill, skin simultaneously. Now, the guy who worked with us on developing these buildings has gone on to invent a thing called the heat mirror, which is sort of a super glazing, which uh, lets heat in and then bounces it back, and it's going to be incorporated in all, oh, by all your major window companies. So his goal is to sort of reestablish this as an energy-efficient type of architecture using new and more efficient type materials, and knowing his ability, we may see this as a future. Uh, but for now, the goal is to come up with this kind of freedom of spirit in a sort of more energy efficient package. Also, we had to make a living, so we went into residential construction. And this is the first house that we built. It's in 1972 in the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey. We built it for a steam fitter and his wife. The site was 80 by 100, so privacy was the major consideration. And the house is uh, spirals upwards from east to west so that the sun is continually entering it as it moves around the horizon and that big circular window faces due south so you get some direct gain uh, at a high level where there's some privacy. That's the concept, sort of somewhat of trying to improve on the snail shell by adding light and ventilation, also with the snail shell not being an, a bad image for a house near a, a beach area. There's a plan and uh, some sections showing how the air moves by using these uh, spherical cross sections and circular plan forms, you get a really efficient 
volume to square footage ratio, and then you got a, a shape that can be easily heated by just one central wood stove. This is in construction <laughs> shots. The um, foundation for the central column on the left, and uh, that's the using just standard concrete block. It's insulated on the outside and it's backfilled. In those days, we called it a basement. I think now we'd probably say it was earth sheltered. And these are manholes. Uh, they're four foot diameter, four feet high, 4,000 pounds each. And in 1972, they cost $80 a piece. And we're able to build a central column by renting a crane and stacking eight of these things in one day. Well, it's also an incredibly uh, scary experience, balancing a 4,000 pound manhole at the top of a ladder off a crane. It's uh, 32 feet high, so we get 32,000 pounds of thermal mass right in the center of, of the building. And it's also your main utility chase. The stairs go around it, and it holds the building up. It was scary, but we got the rainbow at the end, so we took it as a positive omen to continue. This is the floor framing, which is radial around the column. Now these are uh, laminated barn rafters, which in the East and throughout the Midwest are used primarily for agricultural applications, barns, uh, etc. And they're available in a variety of radii, so we just ordered six or seven standard sizes and spiraled them around the column. It's an incredibly cheap way of enclosing space. You get your roof and your walls all in one shot. Uh, the skin is tongue and groove cedar. And when you put on the outside sheathing, the inside is done, and the structural system is exposed. The way you made the building is obvious, and that's the primary aesthetic. It's a kind of a structuralist thing. It's like the inflatables. The way the building is built is the way it looks, and you make something out of that. The insulation goes on the outside, which is now we know that's where it was supposed to be all the time. Uh, we just hooked this guy to the center of the column and he skittered around on a bosun's chair and sprayed three or four inches of urethane foam over the whole building. It makes it watertight and pretty much airtight. It makes it kind of a forerunner of today's super insulated buildings. It requires very little heating and cooling, this building. And then to protect the foam from the sun, we put on a weather coat of it's, it's a, sort of a cement stucco product. It's called Drive It. I don't know if we'd use it again, but it's same color and texture as the beach sand in the area, and it seemed appropriate. There's just some, some finals that shows the sort of Walt Disney soft exterior, and then you've seen the inside is this real hard uh, wood, which comes as a, a big surprise when you come in. Uh, this is called the Helmet House. This is the next house that we built in 1974. It's in New Hampshire on 45 acres for a kind of a Don Quixote type of a guy who uh, <laughs> he wanted a lot of privacy and he wanted his guests to feel sort of ill at ease so that he'd have a psychological edge over them. <laughs> uh, it was a pretty unusual program. It was a real low budget. It was a $15,000 house. And he had picked a site that gave us somewhat of an advantage in that a lot of the house was already done for us. There's a site. It's sort of a big uh, granite outcropping. It's a natural cliff. That's the world's record for thermal mass inside the house. It's just a, uh, it's like a polar bear house at the zoo inside and building a cap over the thing. And we use the same laminated barn rafters, which are uh, this time combined with two by four, standard two by four studs. And each section is built on the one before it and then tipped up sort of like a slinky over the top of this rock. And the whole thing is self scaffolding as you build it. The sheathing is this, it's pre-painted white homosote board. A homosote is a recycled newspaper product. They grind up the old papers and make a building board out of it. And again, when you put the outside sheathing on, the inside is done, the structural system shows, and that's what the major aesthetic is. The insulation goes on the outside. On the right, it's a blue styrofoam, which is a closed cell waterproof styrofoam. And then you tape the seams with some kind of mastic that they give you, and you got a waterproof blue building with a lot of tape on it. And, uh, in order to, to sort of give it a more uniform appearance and a little protection from tree limbs and stuff, we put on one coat of ferro cement over a single layer of chicken wire. Now, the ferro cement is, again, another incredibly cheap material, really durable and really strong. You can smash this building with a hammer and it just bounces off. 
Now this is the inside, which is, uh, it's, again, it's real client-specific and non-standard. So you've got the, uh, on the right-hand side is the, is the, the hearth situation, which is your sort of really basic primitive caveman scene. And on the left is a, it's a bathroom. Uh, you get some visual privacy, but not a lot of acoustical or olfactory <laughs> privacy. In there. It's kind of new and all. It's got this sort of um, yeah. The shower is the same deal. It's uh, it's plumbed right into the rock, so and it's right out in the open, so you don't have to miss any dinner conversation. But it, you, know, um, you get this you get this kind of flash. I mean, you talk about a kind of juxtaposition of weird materials. You got this all this natural rock, raw insulation, and uh, this, you know, we just ran out of money and we didn't finish it. Frank Gehry is now making high art out of this kind of stuff. <laughs> There's the stairs you see on the left, and on the right is the master bedroom. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, he saved a lot of money by doing his own interior decoration. <laughs> Bear men. There's, there's some photos that we took just for the uh, glossy for the media, and as Marvin said, the only magazines that picked this up were Popular Science and the National Enquirer, which did give it the Weird Homes Award in the Elvis Presley issue. <laughs> so I don't feel real close to these houses anymore. I show them as, a, as something that you, we do. When we first got out of school, we thought we could build just about anything, and we did. And uh, <laughs> as it turned out, we got lucky. We were thinking about thermal considerations at the time, and these houses worked. They were cheap, and they were, they were real interesting building experiments. And now we'll, we'll have to get serious here for a minute and move right along to uh, at first the kind of post-oil crisis architecture that we did. Uh, this building was built in 74 in Princeton, New Jersey. Actually, the building was built in about 1850. But uh, the project was done in 1974 for a plastic surgeon in Princeton, New Jersey, who, when the first oil crisis hit, felt that in the future nobody would be able to go anywhere. So if he had a vacation house in his backyard, he'd be way ahead of things. You know, he'd cut himself off. And, you know, he may yet be right. <laughs> But it turned out, we, so we had this old stone house was in his yard. It was too rugged for the builder to tear it down. So he had it all boarded up and he put this pool next to it. And he asked us to uh, remodel the inside into a little vacation house for his family, although they could, only, they could walk to it. Uh, <laughs> so you see in the sections there, uh, originally there had been tie beams across the uh, top. I don't have a pointer, but you know where tie beams go in a, in a gable roof house to keep the roof from spreading. So in order to add a second floor, we had to replace these tie beams, and we did so by sort of suspending that uh, U-shaped structure, which would put a load on the roof rafters and therefore tie the roof together and also act as a kind of a floating second floor. And you see we were sort of literal with our imagery. Since he was a plastic surgeon, we went with the eye, ear, nose, and throat type of motif. <laughs> That's the under construction. It's just like building a house and having the siding on it already. That's a bathroom up there, so you have gravity plumbing, and then a bridge that goes across to the bedroom. And there it is finished. Uh, it's got um, fur flooring when you can still afford it on the floor and on the ceiling. So you have this kind of uh, handcrafted, sculptured item, real busy, hanging in a real neutral sheetrock box, which is shaped as a traditional house is shaped. This is a kitchen. It's got some recycled diner stools. Um, just enough for sort of a weekend camp out. As you can see on the door on the left, it's, a, it's got this bordello imagery. It's also insulated as red velvet with a sort of jealousy window. You know, it provides air, <laughs> view, <coughs> and insulation all in one package. That's all we told the guy who was supposed to be as a friend of ours building. And he took it to the job, and we were a little shocked. This is the. Uh, the stairs, it shows the kind of detail you can get when the architect is also the builder. See, and, uh, it's only recently in history that uh, architects have stopped building their buildings whoops, that's it for the, and delegated the, uh, the authority to someone else. I could probably do that. Hmm. Kind of a handicapped guy who can't do his own microphone. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> as an example of the architect as builder, it's just you get that kind of trim on the stairs as if you mess up on the sheetrock on the job. That's what you get. But it's true that the building has a life of its own and there's no reason to stop when the drawings are done if the same team that designed it is building it 
then you begin to really refine some of those ideas. This is also using the leftover materials. You've got a laminated plywood uh, railing. This old rubber ball with some flock on it for a doorstop. Now moving around doing these kind of buildings, we get somewhat involved in the mobile lifestyle. That's our, our field office. It's a 1956 Airstream trailer. It's pulled by four-wheel drive Jeep. Uh, on the right, it gets way back into the woods of New Hampshire, and there on the left is a retirement community we lived in in South Jersey while we built the snail house. Uh, some idea the interior was done about 1969 or so, so it's sort of a time capsule of that period, complete with super graphics and 60s media. This is for shorter trips. Um, also, Mobile is built in one afternoon out of $50 worth of materials. It's uh, shown on the left in transit and on the right in, uh, in use. That's a structural system. It's these hinge, uh, hinging folding ribs. Its uh, tension is held on it by just a simple black rubber tie down. You hang this bag over it and then tip it up. Uh, and well, it should be a show. The entry is right up a hood and near high and dry. And the, uh, the erection time is a lot faster than the average pup tent. It's got windows too. This is another building that I actually built as my master's thesis when I was in architecture school or as part of it. Uh, the idea of being a project for migrant workers. So this is a demountable building system. And on the left is one module of it, which is a 12 by 12. And the whole criteria was that it would fit in a standard U-Haul or the back of a pickup truck, which it does, and be made out of sort of standard of lumberyard components. So you have wall panels and a column, kind of a friction column system, and then these arched roof panels that are held in place by bolts through the little hand holes in the ceiling. There is a, uh, sort of a, you got to do that in school. You got to show how to be applied to a larger scale, you know, and everything. <laughs> Meanwhile, of course, the school brought, bought the materials and I got to keep it. So there's some real migrant workers using it on a job in the Adirondacks where the site was only accessible by boat. We were able to float out the parts of the house and the parts of our building, and three of us stayed in this thing for three months. Now we're moving into a more mature phase of Jersey Devil history the, the, uh, at mid-decade. Uh, is a concern, emerging concern with alternative energy uh, technology, and these are some of the first give items that we started fooling around with, mostly on our on-site living quarters, and that on the right is uh, a solar oven, and Donna's making chocolate chip cookies in the winter with it. There's a real crude thing, and then on the left is on a camping trip in Baja, California, distilling uh, drinking water out of ocean water just by using a real simple wick type solar still. This would be uh, Doug Hur's $25 windmill in the shape of a pinwheel, one single sheet of sheet metal made into a pinwheel, and now a, uh, it's a wood-fired sauna built out of uh, slash from the construction site in New Hampshire. So after building several sort of eminently sensible uh, buildings or houses, uh, we bought the hype that was going around in, in the mid-'70s and built an active solar house. This is the only one that we've done. It's sort of a hybrid, actually. It's, uh, it's got banks of solar windows and clear stories, and uh, also wood heat. But the solar collector provides about 40% of the heat. It's built for a family that had recently returned from seven years in Tanzania and were homesick for something reminiscent of these African huts that they had grown to love over there. And the only thing I could find that was similar were these wood silos that are made by the Unadilla Silo Company in upstate New York. And uh, we were able to buy three of them for $7,000, double skin, so that we could insulate them. Uh, that's the plan. And it's pretty much like a bubble diagram built, uh, which is, uh, it shows about, <laughs> this is the first thing to have you do in architecture school, in organizing a building. And, and this is about as far as we took that one. Uh, and it suited their lifestyle, because you got three distinct functions which they wanted thermally and acoustically separated. So their separations are these sort of airlock um, entries with double sliding doors. That's some idea of the uh, interior under construction showing the silo roof that they sent us, some insulation, and then we, uh, we split the silos and ran about a, a 90 foot by 4 foot slot down the middle 
which was a natural place for circulation, uh, venting the stovepipes, and then also letting in some light through clear stories, and also take the circles and keep them from being kind of rigid centroidal spaces and make actual directional spaces out of them, which makes them a lot more comfortable to be in. That shows on the right how the structure is once again exposed in the final product and how it's the main aesthetic of the space. This is the construction of the solar collector. It's an air type. <clears throat> now, we knew in 1975 you couldn't buy a solar collector, and we knew what we were building was going to be fairly crude and probably not the latest uh, in the or probably not the final state of the art. So we built the thing with the idea that you could retrofit it really easily. It's not part of the house. In fact, it's kind of a distinct part of the house that, uh, that ties it all together. But there's a space behind it which keeps the wind off it. That's using the recycled uh, aluminum printer's plates as, a, as an absorber, giving the guys something to read while they're working. And uh, there's space behind it, and there's also a walkway in front of it. There's a both for servicing and also serves as a reflector. So now, when photovoltaics are becoming cheaper, if we could get a grant, or if we don't get a grant, even then, when they become available for home use, we could just kind of slot them right in there. As they got the inside furnished, something like a cabin, which is actually great for this type of architecture, it really fits. These are the airlock entries, which are shown from inside. It's got a rotating collection of African art sculpture there in the entry one of them. And that's from the outside. Uh, if you see this, this one item that actually works as a passive cooling device are those big holes, which are, act like venturis and pull the air through, through them in summertime. And you can open that, uh, that circular window as an operable window. So you can keep it open all summer. It won't rain in there because it's covered. And all the uh, hot air from the house drifts up to the ceiling and then is vented out into this space. It really works pretty well. You got these, uh, you got a real rigid mechanical organization to this house. You got these three silos and this kind of uh, feeder like item along the top, real reminiscent of the stuff you see out in the countryside around here. And uh, in order to tie it to the site, there's these more free form, sort of loosely organized decks and ramps, which are much more specific to the site. This is an item that's movable insulation, it's movable only seasonally. In the wintertime, you put it in on the north side, it gives it a kind of a Tudor effect and also reflects light into the inside and then in the spring and summertime and fall the the house can be completely open there and a lot more north light comes in the house uh, that roofing on the back of the collector is a single piece of this vinyl uh, car roofing that you see on these land on tops of uh, expensive Lincoln Continentals that's another summer and winter shot this really shows it clearly that the site is completely different at these two times of year. You got a lot of sun and access to it in the wintertime, and in the summertime, you got all these deciduous trees helping you keep the sun off the house, which is what you want. Okay, moving again to the west coast now. This is called the football house. Um, we built it in California. It's about 40 miles south of San Francisco near La Honda, and uh, solar energy is not a big consideration there. There's not a lot of sun in the redwoods, and it's not really that cold. The major consideration with this house was that it was about a quarter of a mile from the San Andreas Fault. And we were from the East Coast, and we didn't know a lot about earthquake design, so we figured just go with it, I guess. And uh, <laughs> we decided to, we figured we'd do something that would be really graceful when it, when it failed, you know, sort of spinning, <laughs> spinning end over end towards the goalpost at the bottom of the hill. I like to say that this building was built to be used only on Monday evenings by, uh, is by a guy whose wife said she'd leave him if he didn't stop watching football on the television. So we got this built in addition that it was only used on weekends and Monday nights whenever they show the games. That's not true, actually. The guy is actually the building editor for Sunset Magazine, which is the magazine of good taste and Western living on the West Coast. And then they did have to make him move after he built it. <laughs> that part is true. Uh, it looked pretty good on the model. We get this incredibly steep, steep uh, 45 degree slope. And, but actually building it was something else again. We had to send the lightest guy on the crew out to do this particular job. Basically, the structure is two parallel trusses, 12 feet apart from these. Uh, they're cantilevered from these concrete footings, which extend into the hill 10 feet. The trusses are this football or lenticular shape, and the, uh, the floor is, is put in in step sections, and the, and the arc parts uh, hold the roof beams. Everything's a clear span across between them at 12 feet, and you get a box beam across the 
south. Um, so you can get a 12-foot sliding glass door in there for whatever sun comes through the redwoods, comes in and it's sort of reflected off that little deck into the house, and then you got a roof aperture to let in a little more light. There's a, a sun deck that was built out on the south, it was just hanging way out over there, over nothing. This is a connection to the existing house, and it's, it's all truss construction, which, is, which gives you a stairway and then a 30-foot uh, linear bridge, which he converted into a greenhouse. So you got a 30-foot long greenhouse entry into the house. That's after the house weathered a little bit. There's see, we dated it, put a date on the uh, foundation. We figured that would be there a lot longer than the building. And so that after the big earthquake, when they piece together the fragments of life there in Northern California, they'll have something, you know, some sign of the civilization to go by. <laughs> but we like California, though, and we stayed around, and uh, we were able to catch on as uh, kind of maintenance men at this boarding school down there in Los Olivos, which is in the Santa Inez Valley, where uh, Ronald Reagan has his ranch. And uh, this is a, some bureaus that we designed and built, and they're designed to withstand the sort of rugged abuse of boarding school use. And they liked them, so they commissioned us to build a few. There, so you see, we've got our uniforms on there. Uh, the school <laughs> didn't have our names, so we had to go into Tiny and Mo, or Merle, uh, the Tiny and Merle. Uh, you can see in the, uh, on the selection of bureaus that we got some left-handed and some right-handed. The thing there, I guess the national percentage is one out of 11, so one out of 11 is left-handed. It does. And pretty soon, they were really popular, so pretty soon we were running out of space to build them. We were just kind of <laughs> flowing out of the school shop. This is, there we are, it's completely surrounded by these things. It's there, as, that's Pat taking them out into the, into the landscape there for sort of a group portrait. <laughs> this is done here. And so we did this to see, as it wasn't really an original idea, this was exactly the same weekend that Christo was doing the running fence up there in, uh, in Northern California. And he was talking about it was all about bureaucracy, so we figured this would, be, this would be cool to do this anyway. So we did that. Okay, moving from production to sort of one-of-a-kind uh, custom housing. Uh, if you hang around California long enough, you're going to hit the big time, I think, if you're like us. And we, we were able to secure a... Uh, commissioned to design and build a house for a divorce lawyer on 50 acres overlooking the ocean uh, up near San Francisco. Now, this, is, this is not the house, or that's no, not the divorce lawyer, really, but this is a house that um, Jim Adamson, one of the partners in Jersey Devil, built for himself to live in while we were building the other house. Some people have said that the stuff that we built is more interesting than the stuff, uh, the stuff that we built for ourselves to stay is more interesting than what we've done for the clients. And actually, as we've done more work, a lot of it has disappeared from the lecture. But I keep this one in there because it, it shows some ideas that are essential to maybe some idea of a house of a future. Um, the construction is exposed structure. Again, it's just rebar, uh, bent into various shapes with a, one layer of chicken wire. And then you dip burlap bags into a cement slurry and apply them over the structure like a paper mache. And then it gives you a base to which to trowel on some, some regular cement. So it's, um, that's the inside with the structure exposed. His bedroom is actually under the berm on the left there. Uh, it's a quarter circle cross section, and that part that protrudes out of the ground is his living and kitchen area. It's really small. It's efficient. Uh, it grows part of its own food on the roof. There is all his lettuce and carrots, whatever he's got going. Uh, in California, the glazing solution can be really unusual. So it's, uh, it doesn't rain from April until November. It does not rain at all. Uh, so you can pretty much count on not needing any window glass during that period. There aren't many bugs either. Uh, and then in the winter, it rains all the time. So he has these vinyl booties that he pulls over the windows for the winter time and then takes them off the rest of the year. Now, in that sort of eggshell-shaped thing by the entry is uh, he's got gravity water, and then he heats it in his wood stove, and he can take a shower there before he goes in his house, I guess, is where it is, right out on his front porch. So it's smaller, more efficient, grows some of its own food. Perhaps it is the house of the future, but most likely it's not. Most likely, most likely this is going to be the house of the future here, sort of Bauhaus and portable. Uh, we figured we had this big job to do. Uh, we ought to get a field office like all the big construction companies have. So we phoned up Action Office Rentals, which is in Berkeley, California, and asked them to deliver one of their field offices, which they were pretty amazed when they saw where it had to go. But you can see inside it's got this kind of corporate uh, 
tones to the way we furnished it. It pretty, went downhill pretty fast. Uh, there it is with some additions on it. It's got a greenhouse and a porch and a shed for the tools. And uh, the first thing we built was this windmill. The well was there, and we built a windmill to uh, pump the water into this redwood tank, which serves as a gravity uh, water system for the house, which is below this. And also, since water is seasonal there, you need to store it. Um, you know, just order the windmill up from Beatrice, Nebraska, from the Dempster Company, and it comes in a big package without any instructions. <laughs> no problem. <coughs> And that sort of Darth Vader looking thing on the left there is a, uh, it's a solar shower. It's a thermosiphon unit, and that's for the crew. This is the house that we actually built. Um, you can see the site is rather awesome. Uh, it's got a view up to San Francisco to the north, and on the south and west is 10 miles to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, most thing, the thing that's the most awesome about it is the wind, which can reach 100 miles an hour and frequently does, and it comes straight up the hill towards this ridge. Um, and it brings water with it. It's just like having a fire hose shoot at a house from below. All of our normal construction details keep water from coming down. Um, so the scheme here is that first to build a fairly heavy house that will stay there, <laughs> and second to kind of uh, cut it down into the hill so that the wind will go up over the building, but allowing for a south bowl so that the sun will come down in and heat us up. Uh, also, by, just, by not fighting the ridge, um, we were able to, uh, to, to build this kind of curved thing that, that wrapped around a private outdoor space. So the guy had a, has a place for his hot tub and native plants and everything on the leeward side of the building. So he doesn't get blown down in the valley when he goes out to garden. Uh, there's also an attempt here. You see, you see we got grass on the roof, which is, integrates it with the site. There's an attempt here is not to be sort of a cave-like, earth-sheltered building. As I understand Malcolm Wells was here a couple of weeks ago, it's sort of the original caveman uh, thing. I, I, that kind of approach of making the building invisible is okay if you're a bad architect. But uh, I, I don't mean to say much about Malcolm, it's just that he took the whole lecture budget and I had to come for free today. But, but and, then, and then on top of it, he sold some books here, right? I, I understand he sold books. So then I have some Jersey Devil postcards of the football house. If you'd like to see me after the show, I'll sell you some postcards too. Uh, so, no, with all kidding aside, it's this underground thing is okay because ground is in some sense prettier than buildings, but if you're going to make a building that's earth sheltered, it could be a positive earth form, an actual sculpture. And there's some attempt being made here to relate to that concept. Now, this is uh, the plan and section. The plan shows it to be just pretty much a ranch house in disguise, uh, a more energy efficient package. You've got a two car garage with wine cellar off of it, a uh, kids area public spaces and then parents area. It couldn't really be more normal, everybody relating to this courtyard on the outside uh, with the hot tub, which is real standard California procedure. Um, and on the left shows a section, there's a detail uh, that you can see is that big black wall. Is like, it's a truncated trom wall, which is a pretty nice detail, but it's a fairly expensive one to build. You, you maintain the south wall for windows so that you have direct gain and you still have a view. And then the, you get this by natural convection. You get, um, you get heat or you get cooling by opening some vents on the south side. You can use that as a kind of a pump to cool the house in the uh, summertime. These are some, just some construction shots uh, showing the footings. We never really poured a large amount of concrete. We had 175 yards of it to do in this building, and we got good at it pretty fast. Five tons of steel. There's an earthquake uh, requirements in California are just incredible. This is some example of the weather. This could be the same day. We're building the forms here for the trom wall. You can be working with your shirt off, and then this fog would come rolling in off the ridge. Can't see more. <laughs> fog would come rolling in off the ridge, and uh, you'd be running for the long underwear and the vest and the whole thing in the middle of the summer. It's really unpredictable. That shows the vents in the bottom of the trom wall. The trom wall is poured here on the left, and the uh, slab gravels in for the slab, and the services are going in under the slab, plumbing and electrical. This is pouring the slab using an overhead pumper. It's 40 yards in one pour. Now we got pretty good at building these forms, as I said. This is uh, there's one. It's a it's a curved wall with circular windows in it, which is a real killer. And that's the wine cellar in the back. That kind of crypt-like thing. This is the result of some of the pours. We work for about four weeks building forms, and then you pour it all in one afternoon, and then you strip the forms. It's just like Christmas. Open it in the packages. 
That shows the relation that this is how unique this site is. That's San Francisco in the background. And it's 40 miles away. It's a kind of a weird lens that does that to it. This is built this whole monolithic thing out of concrete and then uh, put the roof on it in one day. The roof is just off the shelf uh, warehouse trusses made by the Trustoise Company. They got this kind of uh, lenticular shape, this big snowshoe shape, which gives the whole building this airfoil appearance and then makes it a little bit more like a hill which is what we're trying to do. Uh, we're going to have a sod roof, so we carried the sod roof on this. It's a big curved box beam. You see it in the photo on the left, and the box beam is on, supported by four by fours on four foot centers, which come down and are supported on the trom wall. Now, all the uh, glazing is on a thing. It's like a wood curtain wall. It's completely structurally separated from the, uh, from the main structure of the building, so that you obviously don't have it, all this weight and this huge dirt coming down on the windows. And we put the windows in first because we figured if we put the roof on first and some of this 100 mile an hour wind came, it would just tear the roof off. This is the biggest pour that we did. It's an 18 foot arch for the garage and it cast in some uh, cement catch basins for windows which are glazed up with these, uh, they're glazed up with Perrier bottles which are cut with a bottle cutter and then uh, laid up in mortar inside those holes. Uh, all, the, all these rocks uh, which were veneering, you cast in these anchor slots in the uh, in the concrete, and then you can uh, veneer on stone. Uh, uh, concrete's nice, but the stone uh, helped with this kind of concept of integrating it with the uh, with the site, and also enabled us to put a layer of insulation. We didn't do it here because the garage didn't need to be insulated. Uh, all the stone is directly from the site, which is a pretty low energy way of getting your building material. Uh, the guy who gathered all that stone didn't think it was that low energy of a way. <laughs> He's a poet from New York who spent four months <laughs> hauling him with a Jeep, getting some real construction experience. All right, so where you come around to the, uh, to the north side and the actual house is behind there, the building is insulated with a uh, two-inch layer of rigid foam. Uh, so you have the perfect thermal cross-section. You've got thermal mass on both sides of insulation, which is great for an area that gets alternately very hot and very cold. So the temperature evens itself out inside the house. This is the roof structure. It's a um, tongue and groove, pine decking, all that new stuff is, is over the public area where it's going to show. This is old form boards on the left. There's a plywood diaphragm to stiffen the whole thing up, 3 8 plywood. And then the insulation is on the outside, the foil face. And then there's a regular hot mop uh, roof. I don't know, Malcolm Wells, I guess, is favorable of these uh, big rubber sheets and stuff like that that uh, is a pretty uh, exotic technology for most roofers and they usually end up getting it on there wrong or at least costing you a lot. Um, this, these guys could get 20 years out of a roof that was out of the ground before the sunlight finally broke it down with a build-up roof. Of course, that's, I, I heard the quality of the asphalt's gone down and it's not as reliable as it used to be, but I figured if you can get 20 to 25 years outside until the sun breaks it down, if you protect it from the sun, you're going to go a lot longer. So we just used the best quality build-up roof we could get. <clears throat> it's four-ply with a, uh, a real heavy top coat, extra gravel, and then we put drainage tiles on the roof, which is not traditional, but the, the best way to keep the water out of the building, obviously, is to keep it away from it. So the whole building drains towards this thing in the center, which is a, a big uh, concrete manhole, six foot diameter, which works like a big flower pot. Um, it supports a certain amount of growth and then drains out when it gets full. It also serves to function as a port cochere or entry design. And that's where you go in the building, and it gives that courtyard something of a focus. Uh, there's moving the topsoil on the building in the first crop of winter rye. This is finishing off the south elevation. It shows the trom wall before it's glazed, and those little sliding windows are the summer vents. That's after it's glazed on the right. These are some rocks that we got from the site. Also, they're for, they're for landscaping around the property. <laughs> We had this incredibly skilled guy that was working with us on the, on the loader that cut the house, and it was his idea, and we just couldn't resist it. You know, do it. He, was, man, he could take this thing and he could build stone walls out of it. Yeah, so there's a, um, if you're going to do this kind of work, you really shouldn't use your own truck. He's got, uh, what he got there is like an eight ton boulder and a three quarter ton dump truck. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, that photo there, he's trying to actually dump that thing, and only one side is working, the other side is spitting hydraulic fluid all over the driveway. So you can move those. 
the idea was to build this, you know, these big things. They say the people say, you know, they come back. How the hell did those guys do that? How did they ever get them there? And it, work it in and integrate the whole. It's, I mean, talking organic here. Uh, <laughs> So we had to get the bell from Paolo Soleri for the entry there. So as you get to, there's the north side, some idea of the finished rock work. Uh, you got the small windows which are operable for vents and use it, make use of the venturi action of a small window on the north. There's a courtyard finished and now since there's no wind in there you can support a lot of growth of native plants. All that grows on those hills is this kind of uh, crop of grass every year that blows over almost flat by the wind. It's got its hot tub. There's honeysuckles sort of cascading out of that thing in the center. Now, she's got a, uh, an oak tree that she planted in there, and a the guy came to uh, bonsai it, I guess, recently. It goes out, grows out horizontal. And uh, the whole uh, courtyard, this is taken right after we left, and the whole courtyard is just like a jungle now. It's really fabulous in there. This is, uh, on the right is my favorite elevation of the building, and uh, on the left is, is this you know, excess on the barbecue pit. We got some active solar collectors to heat the hot water, but again, there's some attempt made to integrate them with the building instead of sticking them on there. They're, uh, they're in the north berm where they're protected by the wind. They're circular, which fits in shape with the building, and they're bermed. That's, uh, that's a one little wood item on the south side, which they can go out there and they can see San Francisco from that perch. That was part of the program requirements, and so we got it in there. On the windy side. Now, the inside is also equally opulent as befits the, the program. Uh, but all thermal mass materials in a somewhat acceptable way. You got uh, quarry tile on slab floors, uh, stone partitions, and all the, all the walls that would normally be sheetrock are made out of stucco, so you can have these kind of compound curved uh, shapes. The trusses are exposed in the in the public areas. This is Tom Keller of Menlo Park built the kitchen. It's all steam bent maple uh, with an oak edge. It does the kind of work that you really don't find around anymore. This is the master bedroom area. It's got a laminated wood ceiling. It's a compound curve just out of fur scrap. Uh, the shower on the left is nice the bed. On the right, the headboard is cast into the concrete. It's got recessed lighting in these concrete culverts. We built all the doors. I show you, most people always want to know, oh, you know, how much did this cost? You want to see first what it really was. I mean, we made everything in it. It's nice to use something like a sewer pipe or uh, barn rafters or stuff where you wouldn't expect to use it. And then when you get to something that you would expect to use something standard, like a door, to really rethink the whole thing and do it. These are the entry doors that are made out of redwood. Now, this is really rethinking the concept of the door. Curtis Bill Schreier of the old ant farm built these doors uh, to incorporate storage. He felt that <laughs> he felt it was a good, you know, we we're wasting that space there, and that we, if it had a certain thickness to it, you could put tie racks and shoe things in it and all that kind of thing. So you get these kind of warp plywood funhouse type doors. There, there's one for the bowling trophies on the right. And uh, Curtis also not satisfied with the door hardware that's available. He made his own hardware. This is, uh, on the left is a bathroom, uh, just a throw latch, and on the right is a, a bedroom door, which has got a wood spring that thunks that little arm into a, uh, a thing on the jam. Uh, one of the partners in Jersey Devil, Jim Adamson, is an electrician, and so we did all the lighting as well. That's a, uh, like a night light and combination uh, controls for all the outside lights on the left. On the right, is a, it's a prototype for a residential kitchen. It's got two work outlets and a flexible light source. I just use some flower pots, which give off a really warm light and are incredibly cheap. And these are Almaden uh, bottles. They're cut again with a bottle cutter and they're cast into concrete panels and you just, just mass produce them and put them in as clear stories over the bathroom. Uh, yeah, it's a, obviously a stove pipe with an air diffuser and this is a, it's a Nerf ball uh, with some gooseneck material and a coffee canister in the bedroom. Inside a concrete culvert. He, Jim likes to work with these found materials. There's some details of the trusses and the uh, general of the house. This is the slick kind of corporate side, the south elevation, which faces the raw nature, is real kind of uh, re relentless, uh, hard edge technology is just doing the job, getting the view and bringing in the sun. And the other side, which faces all this millions of people down there in the smog, is real organic and natural. So again, we get this now, again, the day and night picture that I had first in the inflatables, it was kind of hopeless environmentally. We got a similar kind of concept 
um, in a more energy efficient packet. So using uh, proper orientation for your glazing, thermal mass for your heat storage, you can have a house that's which depends on um, taking a building, any old building, and sticking out a lot of symbolism that has meaning in it for other architects. And all, uh, as an aside, maybe for the user. Um, I think this comes because we, as in education in a lot of places, in practice, we're further removed from the job site. Um, we don't do our own building. We don't know how to make things. So a building that you know has all these eagles stuck on it, or whatever kind of symbols you would like to do, I don't follow that stuff real closely, what these guys are putting on the buildings. But it does. It shows me that they don't know anything about building materials, or they don't care. Um, I think this kind of imagery, when you get a building that's really well built, I mean, the layman walks in there, and he knows this is I mean, the guy knew what he was doing when he put this together. I think that's a lot more powerful than this kind of meaningless symbolism that we got now. Also, this postmodernism doesn't seem to deal that much with the energy issue, and I think you're silly if you don't deal with that now. The problem with the guys that, that have been dealing with it is that they've been handymen, engineers. They're filling the gap for architects that aren't interested. Um, so the solar buildings that we do get are kind of unartful, and they, these guys are polarizing each other. They're, uh, you get the Robert Venturi's on one side, and Stanley Tigerman and those guys don't care, Mike Graves, and they're actually hostile towards the energy. And then you get the, uh, we run out of time? What we do? Yeah. I know I'm really preaching here. Right? This is the only sermon of the lecture but that we'll give. Uh, and then you get the uh, guys on the other hand with the oil drums and the rest of this stuff that are solar guys that don't care what it looks like. I think there's a possible for a marriage of the two. I mean, uh, the only guy that's sort of really hopeless would be someone like Robert Stern. But uh, I think Richard Meyer, say, with the right training, could be a good passive solar architect. If you'd move that glass from the west side to the south side, we wouldn't have such a rotisserie, and those houses wouldn't go up for resale every time. Well, that's enough of a sermon, anyway. Just a, uh, just a few fadeaway shots of this incredible <laughs> time that we had on this project, moving away from this megabuck fantasy world back to reality which in reality for us was this $60,000 tract house that we built in uh, southeastern Colorado uh, well, last winter after we were here last. Uh, it's in a place called Colorado City, which is downstream from Rocky Flats, where our government builds the plutonium triggers for the hydrogen bombs. And uh, it's the site of maybe a thousand unexplained cattle mutilations. Is a completely surgical gutting of the cows with no other reason other than the fact that most people believe it to be the work of extraterrestrial beings. So almost everybody in this area believes in UFOs. Uh, so we had this kind of imagery to work with. Uh, plus we had the client who was uh, this 6'5", 250 pound ex-football player who liked to build, car. he built that car in the picture and built is just a real airplane nut. And he wanted the house to reflect his interest in airplanes and be sort of cheapo technology too. And then this whole development here is owned by the Hunt brothers. And you can see um, in the, on the right is maybe 700 lots. They're less than a quarter of an acre. And uh, there's one guy who came before us. He's in the background there. But we're, we're the first house on our particular cul-de-sac. So we have a real heavy responsibility to set the style for this particular <laughs> development. <laughs> so we got my client, who's this huge a uh, black ex-football player building this strange house here on a quarter of acre lot. I think he's a pretty smart guy. I don't think he's going to have too many neighbors. I don't know if that was the, the plan. But he's also a pilot. He wanted his pilot's letters right on the roof. So he did that. You, can see, you can see from that the contrast between that last uh, slide of the open space and there's the actual site plan on the left. Uh, the, the site, the wedge shape of the site, actually dictated the form of the house. It distorted the normal diagram into this triangle, which fortunately faces south, and it's almost like a solar diagram. It's, uh, it's wide on the south, and it's narrow on the north, and it's earth-sheltered uh, to protect it from the winds on the northeast and the northwest, uh, which are also the sides of potentially going to have any neighbors if he ever has any. Um, and then at the neck is where you go in, uh, and it's a two-level space where you change heights and go down into the sunken area. The frost line in Colorado is four feet, so you might as well start the house at four feet if you have a sloped side so you don't waste all that frost wall. And then his workshop for working on cars and where the laundry is and the entry and all that business is a separate zone. It's insulated, but it's also insulated away from the rest of the house. So it's secondary. If we get extra heat in the, in the main part of the house, we can let it up into that zone. 
But we don't really have to heat that at night because he's not going to use it. So in the daytime, it's good enough. And then he's got access to the outside to his little carport where he can work on his vehicles and on airplane engines. And the house is real small. So it's, it's basically one space. It's got this uh, central living room, those sort of dividers, those fat dividers are just four foot high water tanks. And they store the heat for the uh, solar. And they also serve as space dividers. And the only space that's completely enclosed would be that number four is a, no, number four is a jacuzzi. That's out in the open. It would be the bathroom is the only space that's completely enclosed. It would kind of gotten mature in our later work. There's a big cross section. That's an airplane wing truss that we use. It obviously fit this guy's house pretty well. Uh, it shows, the cross section on the right shows the two levels. One where the door at the junction of those levels, and I don't have a pointer again, is like a valve. Uh, lets the extra solar heat to the upstairs, and you got an attic, which is kind of an antiquated concept <coughs> in, how, in housing, but attic really makes sense. In a place like this with 6,000 foot elevation, the sun is brutal. There's no trees on the site, there's a few little cactus. And uh, the idea is that you have a power ventilated attic, uh, and you can keep a layer of cool air between you and a hot sun, and plus in an attic, you're not constrained by your structure to the depth of your insulation. So nowadays we're putting you know, instead of, we used to put six inches in the roof, now we put 20 or something like that. So I got 14 or 15 inches, I got R45 in the roof. And now they tell me out in Colorado, that's kind of conservative. But uh, the state of the art today means that, you know, instead of beefing up the structure, you build a little attic and it works pretty well. That shows again the water tanks, which I'll show in the later photos. This construction is all again, real cheap materials. The basement insulated on the outside with uh, blue styrofoam, backfill. Uh, this kind of lattice structure, which breaks the contact, thermal conductivity between the studs, and also it sets up uh, like furring strips for the sheathing of the house, which is this is a brown stuff there, is a corrugated asphalt, which is used in uh, agricultural construction. That's the south elevation on the right. So all nothing bigger than a two by six, and we get brown corrugated asphalt on the walls for heat absorption of the low winter sun, and then we get silver corrugated asphalt because it's cool, I guess, and, uh, and reflective on the roof uh, to reflect the high summer sun. This is, again, for image, again, it's, it's not your typical earth-sheltered house, it's, but it is. We got to the site, and it was so bleak and hostile. There's nothing out there but cactus. And the, and the original plans for a house called it was kind of softer, more rounded thing. It might have shown in the drawing. And uh, it became much more spiky and pointy, more like a desert creature, cactus-like. And you got these big fangs like a rattlesnake uh, eating the car there. Uh, it's, it's, the idea is that it's a real site-specific architecture. And uh, in, in that sense, it works. It's sort of half buried in for protection and half kind of uh, lashing out, too. And then, of course, the part that flies out of the ground isn't thermally that critical. It's just a carport. There's a carport, it's just exposed structure, two by four trusses which we made on site, the plywood roof shows, corrugated asphalt walls, and uh, that's, uh, that's a, a siding grade masonite that we use for the sheathing there and then uh, insulated steel doors. It's real simple materials, again, uh, trying to make some kind of art out of them. The only industry in Colorado City is a, it's a Dore lamp company and make those beanies for police cars. That's what we use for those, for the eyes of the <laughs> snake eyes, lights over there. The, the reason for the sort of skip tooth window arrangement on the back side is we use these windows called Sunflake windows that are made in Colorado. They have an integral sliding insulating panel. It slides into a pocket in the wall. So you can see on the left, on a cloudy day, you can slide, the, slide them closed. This is also true in the summertime. You can keep them closed, too, and cool with them. And then on the right, you're, you're open and collecting a lot of sun. This item over the patio door serves a number of functions. It's a shader. You need a two-foot overhang there to keep the summer sun out of it. It also signals that that's going to be a door. It's a portico share. And then by sticking out, it provides a space for the exterior lighting. Uh, by being a triangle, it stiffens the balloon framing of the south wall. And then uh, on the top of it, we've made a thermosiphon preheater for the domestic hot water which is also sort of part of the siding of the building. Instead of sticking the collector on the building, it's real integral to it. It's got a window in it also for, for venting, which also has a sliding insulating panel that you run with a stick. It's just some general idea that kind of the aesthetic of the corrugating, corrugated material, you can get a corrugated clear or translucent stuff, that round thing as a window. 
or at least a skylight type of thing, clear story. And this corrugated asphalt can go right into the ground. The, the dirt doesn't affect it at all. So you lose, a, you usually there's a real fussy change of materials where the concrete goes in the ground and comes up and then you can start your building. This just goes right in. Now, maybe not good where termites are. Although I think the termites only go up to outside. This is some idea of the interior. Um, it's real cheap and uh, fast, as we could do it. We poured the floor with integral red color in it, cut a pattern of uh, diagonals in there, so it's sort of like a sidewalk, and then varnish it with urethane, and it was finished. Uh, everything else is sheetrock, and you get this, the ceiling of the attic is all warped. Uh, so you have the real deep clear stories there on the left. You can see them, and all the light is diffused throughout the space. You don't have this kind of harsh glare that you get in a lot of these big sun traps. It shows, should show, on the foreground and in the background there is, uh, are these big red water tanks, which we made, had made by a local welder that are filled with water, 1,200 gallons of water in the house, uh, that are sort of innocuous. They're just like big mouths. It could as well be a wall. Uh, the ones obviously under the kitchen counter, are, it's, it turns out these 55-gallon drums are just three-quarters of an inch short of kitchen counter height, which is perfect. It's a kind of a novel use for those in terms of water storage. Little funky. <laughs> That's a warped ceiling, and then some of the insulating panels closed, and then some idea of how the light moves around in there. I figured while everybody's moving into these kind of pastel things, we had done that a pretty long time ago, so we, now we're going back to kind of last gasp of the modern movement, pure white, shooting the light around. <coughs> and that's the hallway, shows a, um, some of those clear stories, and uh, there's a mobile, it's made out of toy planes. Every time I run into a toy plane in the thrift store, I send it to the guy, and he adds them. And the whole hallway will be like cluttered with these with this mobile uh, toy planes. As it's winter and summer, the usual problem with a TV antenna, you know, in a normal house you can stick it on there, it's not a real big deal, but some of these sculptural things that we fool around with, it's got to be considered. So here it just really adds to the alien uh, UFO quality of the thing. Stick it right by the door where everyone can see it. It's a hyperbolic uh, soffit which works as a shader in the <coughs> summertime and then reflector in the wintertime. This is, these pictures are taken in December. No snow, or not too much. I had a pretty mild winter that year. I had some snow, and he got about 80%, he figured, the first year of his heat from just passing solar and all of his domestic hot water. Now, I wish I could say we learned something about UFOs from our visit in Colorado, but oh, I really, <coughs> have only just this one incident. This is That picture on the left was taken at lunchtime uh, when they were sitting down to eat our lunch and suddenly the sky got really dark and this big beam of light came down. And this, uh, these guys came in and grabbed our best worker and took him off in that spacecraft on the right. You can see there too. And uh, you know, we haven't seen him since then. And just last week I see uh, he came to my door. I'm living in a log cabin in Bloomington, Indiana. He came to my door and he had this bag and he had three coffees and a prune danish with him. <laughs> So anyway, uh, the normal question after these, uh, after these lectures is, you know, how do you guys get started in this kind of thing? And uh, there is a unique opportunity for architectural school graduates to get involved in this uh, design-build way of life. And uh, even if you don't do it, I mean, I don't anticipate doing it all my life, although I always have said that and I keep doing it. Um, it's a good experience to have and it's a good way to get started. There aren't a whole lot of jobs in the field when you get out of school. Except for um, if you go out on your own, you'll find that almost everybody that's considering building a small addition or a deck has trouble finding both a builder and an architect to take something that small. Now, an architectural graduate, a recent student, has such low overhead, he can design the hell out of that thing. He can offer six different models for it and, uh, and really put a, the kind of enthusiasm into it that's warranted that the regular guy who's been around the pike for a while just really doesn't want to deal with it. So, I mean, now the builders are having a hard time now because of this mortgage money and the builders are moving into this field, but it's still wide open for new people. And this is where, of course, we're relegated to now. We're not getting a lot of new houses. So last winter we were in Los Angeles, which is, also shows we're getting kind of older and I can't take the winter anymore. But uh, Los Angeles in the winter is a rather a pleasant place. As you can see on the left, the air is clear and you can see that the city is actually surrounded by mountains which, on which snow falls. And you can also see lemon trees grow in the winter there and avocados. And we're building a, uh, on the right there, addition to this sort of 50s modern house, which is in a neighborhood where there's seven Richard Neuter houses in one block 
and a whole bunch of these Schindlers and Lautners. A real heavy historical content, so we, context. So we don't want to be too bad there. And uh, we've got to go with the white stucco LA look <laughs> over these kind of strange shapes. But the program is pretty normal Los Angeles uh, type of thing. It's a hot tub, uh, a deck, and a sunroom. Or two decks, <laughs> an upper and a lower deck a sunroom on a really incredibly steep hill, which is going to slide someday. So this is what we did. There was looking over the uh, city of Silver Lake or out into the valley of Burbank and Glendale. Uh, this is not to say that you could do this right out of school, but it's a, it's a scale of job that, it, um, you know, you don't have to worry about it leaking. And it's a scale of thing where you can pick up some basic construction skills and the stakes are not that high. And uh, as soon as you do one, if you're not like us and don't want to keep moving around, if you stay in the same area, you'll get more. And pretty soon you'll have something going and the jobs will get bigger and times will get better. Hopefully. That's the goal. There's some, uh, just some nighttime shots. The Hollywood Hills in the background. This is the first chance we ever had to work with grids. There was an actual street in front of the building and, a, and that building was on a grid. And, it was all the stuff that you learn in school, how you're supposed to respond. So we responded, and all these grids were coming together, and they all came together at this one point. And there was no place to go but up. So we put, and also we had all this, we had this uh, natural, this stucco exterior enclosing this real kind of heavy duty wood in, inside shell, and it needed something really alien in the center. And right where everything comes together is where that tower goes, which is just a TV tower. Um, sort of a Watts Tower like item, which holds the lights, and those are inverted funnels and a, a toilet plunger on the top of it. The, the, the stucco itself, again, the sunroom is uh, some idea of, of using this sort of taco stand, LA, big gross shapes, uh, supported by this real light, high technology glass, uh, what do they call it, case study house, LA style. We combined all the LA styles in one building. You got everything there but chain link fence. <laughs> I, I can't deal with that. It's just too hostile of a symbol for me. Um, so anyway, this is the beat now, just to show you again, going way back in scale. When times were hard, we built stuff. We built an addition once to a rabbit hutch. It wasn't even a rabbit hutch, it was an addition. But um, this is our very first job, and it was a place where the client was six months old for this one. <laughs> and it was built for him to grow into. And it was a family in Princeton, New Jersey, and it, it, it's a play structure, and it's out in the suburbs, and it's designed sort of as a big, like big cockroach that ate suburbia, and it's in that shape. And the interior there on the left is scaled, uh, for, for a four foot high person and uh, this kind of thing, small additions, play structures, playgrounds is a good way to get started without getting in over your head and it's, it, uh, it's an incredible amount of fun and it's really uh, worthwhile as an education. And so finally, uh, I'd like to say that it, even though we have gotten some recognition for our efforts, I've been in the New York Times Magazine as Marvin said, they're my, on a, trying to be on the cover of it. Uh, and been to New York City, I like the thing that we haven't lost a, um, or a joy of working and a sense of humor that's essential to whatever you choose to do for your life's work. So that's it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Yeah, it's, 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 it's